It's one of the classic tropes in sci-fi. You go to space, you get blasted by cosmic radiation, and come back as a mutant with superpowers. It happened to the Fantastic Four and the Super Apes. It plays a role in Doctor Who and Earthworm Jim. It even comes up in the Andromeda Strain, Star Trek, X-Men, and Rick and Morty, and so much more. But that's just science fiction. What about science fact? In this episode, We'll explore the real-world impacts of radiation in space, plus some of the innovations on Earth that are helping to expand human potential. Now that is seriously super. Hi, I'm Forrest Valkai, and this is Space for Humans. So what happens to real humans when they're bombarded by cosmic radiation? To answer that question, NASA looked not to a Fantastic Four, but to a tremendous two. Identical twin astronauts Mark and Scott Kelly. In 2015, they launched Scott Kelly into space for almost a full year. 340 days in low orbit aboard the International Space Station. Ha! While Mark, his identical twin, stayed home down on Earth doing cool stuff. What are you doing? Twin study, twin hosts. Double the DNA. Double the science! NASA's landmark twin study was the first of its kind to use identical twin astronauts to investigate the effects of long-duration spaceflight on the human body. Like bone loss and muscle deterioration. And you can learn more about these physiological impacts in my space exercise video. One of the important findings of the twin studies was a change in some of Scott Kelly's DNA markers during his year in space, including shifts in gene expression. By the time that he returned to Earth, most of these shifts had already been reverted back to his normal pre-flight state, but some of them, about 8 to 9 percent, remained changed. That's not enough for him to turn into a crime-fighting superhero, but it is still pretty interesting. So what caused these shifts in gene expression? Most likely, it was Scott's exposure to ionizing radiation while aboard the ISS. You see, the Earth's magnetosphere mostly protects us from cosmic rays which can penetrate both spacecraft and human tissue. And the ISS is actually still inside the Earth's magnetosphere, so Scott was partially shielded, but not completely. NASA estimates that in orbit, every single cell of an astronaut's body is bombarded by a proton every few days, a helium nucleus every couple weeks, and a big, heavy, larger element every couple months. And that's a lot of damage! Uh, uh, uh. In deep space, like a mission to the moon or to Mars, unshielded radiation exposure would greatly exceed what NASA considers healthy. And that's a problem we need to solve before we suit up humans for long-haul flights to other planets, because when it comes to health and safety, a neck pillow isn't going to cut it. But the twin study helped us better understand the risks, so we can focus on developing solutions. So what exactly happened with that 8-9% to of Scott's DNA markers? And what do we actually mean by DNA markers anyway? Let's talk for a second about epigenetics. That's it for me! We only need to see one forest for the phylogenetic trees. Uh. Thanks, Eric. Epigenetics refers to molecular processes that modify gene activity without changing the underlying DNA sequence itself. Think about this. Your DNA is the same in almost every single cell in your body. That means that your eyes and your bones both have the exact same instruction manuals to work with. So why aren't your eyes made of bones and your bones made of eyeballs? It's because epigenetic differences in those cells causes different genes to be turned on or off. Epigenetic changes occur in a variety of ways, but they all essentially boil down to the same concept. Changing whether a gene is expressed, and if so, how much. Your DNA is stored by being wrapped around protein complexes called histones. This creates a thick rope called chromatin, which is what makes up your chromosomes. If that chromatin is wound loosely, then that stretch of DNA is accessible to the molecular machines that allow it to be expressed. So we call it transcriptionally active, meaning that it's able to be transcribed into mRNA and then translated into a protein. But if it's wound super tightly, the genes in that stretch would be rendered transcriptionally inactive, meaning that they're not accessible to be expressed. Simply put, what instructions are written in your DNA is really only half the question. 
The other half is whether or not those instructions can actually be read. Whether a particular stretch of DNA is wound tightly or loosely depends on the presence of specific biomarkers, which are attached to the histones that it's wrapped around. So chemical processes which add or remove those biomarkers, processes like phosphorylation, methylation, acetylation, or ubiquitination, can trigger the remodeling of your chromatin, and by extension, the expression of your DNA. The key lesson here is that many environmental factors, including stress, diet, and yes, cosmic radiation, can cause these biomarkers to be written or erased across your genome. For example, smoking has been shown to cause epigenetic changes, which can switch off certain protective genes, and living a healthier lifestyle has been shown to reverse these changes. So your day-to-day -day life is at least partially in control of how your DNA is expressed. And just when you think you've got all that figured out, RNA comes along and makes everything infinitely more complicated. You see, RNA isn't just the stuff that carries the instructions for a protein. That's just mRNA. There's also rRNA, which is what ribosomes are made of, and tRNA, which carries amino acids, and a few dozen more types of RNA, all of which do pretty incredible and vastly different things. One of those is a type of small, non-coding RNA called microRNA, which is responsible for post-transcriptional gene expression regulation. Remember the simplified pathway that we talked about just a moment ago, that DNA is transcribed into mRNA, which is then translated into a protein. Well, microRNA works by binding to and destroying mRNA. That means that you can have a gene which is wound as loosely as you like and being transcribed like crazy, but you have another part of your DNA that's coding for a specific microRNA, which makes sure that none of those transcripts ever get translated into proteins. That's what we mean by post-transcriptional gene expression regulation. And yes, the expression of that microRNA can be influenced by other epigenetic factors. One important thing to keep in mind through all of this is that epigenetic changes are not technically mutations. Mutations are changes to the DNA sequence itself, which are often far more dangerous, harder to detect, and much more difficult to reverse. But from the outside looking in, both mutations and epigenetic changes look awfully similar. It's also important to remember that just like mutations, epigenetic changes aren't good or bad by themselves. Instead, like most things in biology, they're dynamic and contextual. Our genomes are loaded with epigenetic information from our evolutionary history, which is proven to be adaptive and helpful. But sometimes things can go in another direction, with epigenetic changes also being linked to things like changes in immune function, or aging, or even cognitive decline. This is a relatively new area of science, and there's a lot more learning and exploring to be done here, and you could be just the scientist to do it. The instructions for a human body are a lot more complex and interesting than those of some IKEA shelf. But in both cases, those instructions are pretty important to, well, shelf life. <laughs> Another important finding was that Scott's epigenetic changes only occurred during the second half of his one-year mission, and wouldn't have been detected at all during a typical six-month flight. This suggests that epigenetic effects may compound over time, and when considering human spaceflight, we may need to treat the situation more like an x-ray, and consider how much exposure someone can take, rather than whether or not we can prevent them from taking any at all. And that's really important as we imagine longer missions, like a three-year trip to and from Mars. Imagine an astronaut whose genetic expression has been influenced so much by life in space that they struggle with life back on Earth. Long-term exposure to cosmic radiation could also create epigenetic risks that may not be apparent for decades. Through exploring epigenetics, we found a number of epigenetic-related diseases, including certain cancers. And epigenetic change is strongly associated with aging as well. This means that an astronaut accumulating these space-specific epigenetic changes could potentially experience a variety of novel symptoms or the earlier onset of age-related health issues. Moreover, epigenetics might play a role in acute spaceflight ailments, as some studies have associated astronauts' loss of bone density with epigenetic changes in their bone cells. And for better or for worse, some epigenetic changes can actually be passed on to our offspring, meaning that spaceflight could have evolutionary implications as well. But don't let all this scare you. As I mentioned earlier, your genome is loaded with epigenetic information that we've accumulated over millions of years, and there are tons of ways in which epigenetic information actually helps you. Astronauts' epigenetic reprogramming may include cells adjusting their metabolism, bolstering DNA repair, or conserving resources in microgravity. That is adaptation in action. 
There's also the potential for developing medicines that mimic or even encourage these beneficial epigenetic effects. Think about it. We have medicines now which can manage motion sickness for bumpy rides or choppy seas. Imagine a pill or a patch that could help you be more comfortable during a space flight, or even alter your DNA expression to make you a better starship pilot. There's also evidence that people and animals vary in their inherent radio sensitivity, and that's important because radiation exposure is linked to a variety of issues, not the least of which being increased cancer risk. So if some people are better predisposed to things like DNA repair or immune response, could we screen for potential astronauts who have radiation resistance or microgravity adaptation abilities? The answer is a bit complicated. It's very likely that real-time epigenomic monitoring will become standard astronaut medicine. There's also potential for CRISPR and other methods to alter DNA to reduce health risks in space. But that raises some really interesting moral and ethical issues. You've probably heard of CRISPR before, but what actually is it? CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspace Short Palindromic Repeats. Say that five times fast. Basically, it's a DNA sequence that acts as a defense mechanism in your body, with the ability to cut up DNA of an attacking virus. Scientists realized that they could take this sword and turn it into a pair of scissors to make cuts and edits to DNA. You see, CRISPR has two components. First up, Cas9, a protein with the ability to make these DNA cuts. Picture Cas9 like your favorite video game character. He's got a weapon, and now he needs a map. That's where the guide RNA comes in. It's how scientists give the protein a quest to complete. Once Cas9 follows the map to the right DNA sequence, it makes the chop. <coughs> then scientists can come in and make changes. And that has a lot of incredible potential, from fighting diseases to growing stronger crops, but it's also really expensive. And like Forrest says, it raises a lot of serious ethical issues. NASA already conducts extensive medical evaluations and uses strict selection criteria for their astronauts that favor exceptional health and fitness. Potential astronauts are screened for cardiovascular health, vision, and psychological stability, and many, many other factors. So it's not a stretch to imagine extending this to the molecular level. For example, examining if a candidate has genetic variants associated with stronger DNA repair or lower cancer risk. But is that ethical? The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, of 2008 generally prohibits employers, including federal agencies like NASA, from using genetic information in hiring or job assignments. NASA can't simply exclude an astronaut candidate because, for example, they carry a BRCA1 gene variant which is linked to certain cancers. That would be discriminatory. For now, NASA is focusing on understanding genetic and epigenetic profiles in astronauts to inform the advancement of biomedical science, rather than trying to restrict who can fly. In the future, if research identifies a clear protective genotype or biomarker, then the agency could consider incorporating it into crew risk assessments. Sort of like how people with colorblindness are barred from being astronaut pilots. But that would need to be a very careful calculation. Instead, genetic screening might be used in a more supportive way. For example, to decide if an astronaut would benefit from additional radioprotective therapies or more frequent health monitoring while in space. In the coming era of long-duration missions, real-time genomic and epigenomic monitoring could become a standard part of astronaut medical care. On the ISS, astronauts already undergo regular health checks, such as blood panels, ultrasounds, and cognitive tests. So adding molecular monitoring, for example periodic blood draws to sequence DNA or assess epigenetic markers, could allow flight surgeons and other medical professionals to detect potentially harmful changes early. NASA, along with genes in space, have already demonstrated real-time sequencing of the genes of certain microbes, and even conducted CRISPR gene editing experiments on yeast aboard the ISS in order to study DNA repair in microgravity. Depending on what we learn from these kinds of experiments, technology like CRISPR could be used to enhance radiation resistance in astronauts by modifying their genes to allow for better DNA repair or cell survival. For example, one idea is to edit human cells to express the same kind of radioprotective proteins found in extremophiles, such as the DSUP or DAMA suppressor protein found in tardigrades. That said, genetically modifying humans for space travel also raises some pretty profound ethical issues. The first concern being safety. Human gene editing, especially germline editing, which can be passed on to offspring, is highly controversial because of the potential for unintended evolutionary consequences. Editing genes in advance to make someone super resistant to radiation also veers into human enhancement, and that raises concerns about creating genetic classes of people with augmented astronauts being distinct from normal folks like you and me. And what implications would that have for equality or human identity? 
If we can edit for radiation, why not edit for other traits deemed desirable for missions like better memory or less need for sleep? Should we sacrifice equality for performance? What if it's a consensual choice of the crew member? But then would that be fair to the other crew members that aren't choosing to be enhanced in this way? Who's choosing which traits are most desirable? And what happens if or when that technology gets out of the labs and into the hands of the general public? How far might voluntary evolution go if anybody can choose what story they want their DNA to tell? The point is, any attempt to alter an astronaut's genome, no matter how beneficial it may seem at first, should undergo broad and serious societal discussion. It's simply not a decision that NASA can make in a vacuum, even if it is the vacuum of space. In summary, screening for radiation or microgravity resilience remains a promising but sensitive prospect. As our knowledge grows, it may pave the way for personalized astronaut care, ensuring that each individual has the best chance to withstand the hazards of space rather than as a means of limiting opportunities. The emphasis should always remain on enabling humans of diverse backgrounds to fly safely by tailoring the environment and medical support to their needs. We just need to be careful not to accidentally create a new species of genetically distinct spacefaring super soldiers along the way. In the end, we can protect the brave heroes who venture out beyond the boundaries of our humble planet without compromising the core values that define our humanity, either here on Earth or out among the stars. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. And I'm Eric Stribling. If you want to learn a little bit more about biology, you can follow me on my channel or find me at falkylabs.com. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell for more Space for Humans. Never stop learning. <laughs> the meat. Eric, wearing the same shirt, now comes on the screen with me and says, Mark stayed home. <laughs> Mark.